Well, greetings, Ames Chamber of Commerce members. Dan Colhane here with uh, State Senator Herman Kornbach from Ames, from District 23, joining us to answer a few questions as we lead up to the 2021 legislative session. Senator Kornbach, welcome. Happy to be with you. Always, uh, always in, uh, in need of input from chamber members and other constituents. Well, we, we do appreciate your time and consideration today. Uh, I think we'll get right started. We've got about 15 minutes together and uh, I've got a few questions that I, I, I provided you ahead in advance. We'll try to hit a, a couple of those and uh, give you some time to share your thoughts on the upcoming session. But first and foremost, what should members of the Ames Chamber of Commerce expect from the 2021 legislative session? Well, it's hard for me to speak for 149 other legislators plus a governor. Um, I can talk to you about what some of my priorities are going to be. I continue to be the ranking member on the Senate Education Committee, a committee that I chaired uh, for six years. And uh, education in this community is always going to be a top priority. So uh, the region's funding is, is going to be uh, very important. Um, the um, uh, legislature passed a budget last year that, that supposedly was a status quo budget, but somehow the regents got cut $8 million. Uh, President Winterstein from Iowa State has asked for that to be restored. Her share is $3.2 million, and they need on top of that about an $18 million increase. They're actually out about $150 million between lost student revenues as well as COVID-related extra expenses. So uh, they're asking for a fraction of the um, money that they would need to make them whole. Uh, I think that that is something we need to do. For K-12, um, there's also a funding need. Uh, you know, next year's funding um, is based on last fall's enrollment count. And usually that's a reasonably good estimate of the next year's enrollment, but this year that's clearly not gonna be true. The state is actually down about 6,000 students, at least in terms of the formal count is concerned. But a lot of that has to do with parents keeping their, a lot of parents keeping their kids home. So um, using last fall's count is going to weigh under fund K-12 schools. And we need to do something about that. I'm gonna to propose to let schools use the enrollment number uh, either from this last fall or from the previous fall, whichever is higher. And I think that that would make up most of the difference. Um, uh, I need, uh, I have some other education priorities include, including uh, some weighting in the formula for kids from low income backgrounds uh, who probably don't have the same educational advantages of, uh, of middle class students. Uh, and, and there are some other priorities, but um, you know, I'm not gonna go through the whole list of all the possible issues. Uh, those are some things that I tend to intend to work on uh, for our community. Thank you. So sure, the, my, ne my next question really was, what were you personally hoping to accomplish in 2021? And you, you've certainly touched on those. If there are other things, Senator, please uh, feel, feel, feel free to share. Well, one of the priorities, and, and uh, you in your earlier communications mentioned this, is extending uh, broadband communication. Uh, that has been an ongoing issue for a number of years, but the, the COVID situation, the pandemic situation has really brought that to the fore. Uh, the other thing that's really been brought to the fore is the need for additional assistance for childcare. Um, I think that we need to go back and look at the tax uh, credit in the uh, tax code. There's, there's a funny thing there where if you make a, a little bit more money, you lose all of your child care tax credit. It's called a cliff. Um, I think that we need to fix that. I think we also need to do something in terms of raising the pay of child care workers. And some of these smaller child care operations, there have been some real problems at, at a few of them uh, with regard to poor standards, child mistreatment, et cetera. So I think we need some, some, um, some additional work done there. Well, I'm glad you mentioned broadband. You know, as I, as I gave you the list of priorities for the Chamber of Commerce for 2021, that is, that is certainly a significant priority for the organization. Given, given the fact, as you said, it was, it was certainly highlighted uh, the last 10 months with the pandemic of people working from home, broadband is going to be a, a high priority going forward. Do you see an appetite at the legislature in 2021 to, to, to fund uh, broadband 
and to do more to enhance broadband across our state? Oh, I certainly do. Uh, the governor in a recent newspaper article pointed to, I think it was $81 million. If you don't mind my reaching over here to double check my figure. Yeah, $81 million in state and federal funding. And that's leveraged a fair amount of uh, private sector investment. But I think that we need to, to, to keep the pressure on that. Uh, certainly uh, for children trying to learn from home, from workers trying to work at home, uh, that has only served to dramatically increase the need for broadband communication. Um, and I think long term, uh, that's uh, something that we need to adjust. Uh, how many of these COVID related adjustments we're going to see uh, uh, persist in the environment is, is not clear, but I think you're going to see a lot more working from home. I think you're going to lot of see a lot more meetings uh, done by uh, done electronically or virtually, I guess they call it, um, rather than spend a lot of money on airplane travel or other travel time. Uh, so now there are a couple of advantages here, uh, especially for some of our smaller communities. Uh, I've always thought that one of the obstacles for business development in small communities is not having an adequate labor force altogether in one place. Well, what we've been working with uh, the last uh, eight or 10 months is basically a distributed workforce. And I think that for smaller communities, you know, they can cite some of their business in a small community and then link in the rest of their workforce that they need electronically. Um, that could provide an opportunity for business development or business location in some of our smaller towns. So, so there actually is, if you look hard enough for it, there actually is a positive thing or two that might come out of this. The technology seems to have improved and certainly people's familiarity with technology has improved. Without a doubt, Senator, that is, that really is the silver lining related to the pandemic is that I think everyone has become more adept at using technology for meetings like we're having right now. And the, the technology works and it's a great way to communicate. It isn't the way we wanna communicate forever, I don't think, but it's certainly been a silver lining that's proven that we can, we can send people home and they can be productive, which is really important. Yep, 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 I, I think that's true. Uh, that's why I think it will be a high priority, uh, really from both sides of the aisle. Yes, that, I, I, would, I would tend to agree with your thinking there. You know, uh, another issue that uh, is important to the organization this, in the coming session, Governor Reynolds' Invest in Iowa initiative. Can you talk to that at all? I mean, certainly, as we, as we think about as a Chamber of Commerce, we're always trying to enhance quality of life, quality of place to attract more people to our state and, and, and more specifically to Ames and Story County. Can you talk a bit about the, the Invest in Iowa initiative and, and where you see that uh, moving in 21? Sure. Well, the governor proposed that last year. Uh, it really has a lot of moving parts. Uh, some of those parts I would be happy to support and have supported in the past, but others are, are quite troubling. Um, the, um, let me take it step by step. Uh, the first piece of this is the I will, um, the um, constitutional amendment that was adopted actually 10 long years ago uh, to increase the sales tax by three eighths of a percent and to use the money for a variety of environmental and outdoor recreation purposes. Uh, I supported that in the legislature. It had to pass the legislature twice before it went on the ballot. Uh, and then I voted for it along with 62% of the rest of the electorate. Uh, so that's something that, that we should have done a long time ago. Now, I'm not awfully thrilled about using the sales tax because that's a regressive tax, but the voters approved it and three eighths of a percent isn't very much if you spend you know, $100 on a set of uh, some new clothes at JCPenney or $100 on some building supplies uh, down at Lowe's, uh, three eighths of a percent cost you 37 and a half cents. Out of $100, that's not gonna change anybody's quality of life. And when it funds outdoor recreation, which is, which is a very cheap form of recreation, right? It means that, that people can get out and enjoy parks and uh, at very little cost. Uh, that helps to offset the regressive nature of the way we'd be paying for it. So, so that would be fine with me if we could do that. Uh, another piece, uh, the governor is proposing uh, to fund uh, mental health. Over the last three years, we passed a couple of different bills uh, to, do, uh, to set up a mental health structure for both adults and another bill for children. We basically put up the framework 
but we didn't put any money on it to put the walls and the floor and the roof in. So we need to come up with some money uh, to do that as well. Mental health is, is really critical. And again, that's something that the COVID experience has emphasized. The no problem question. is uh, that the governor is proposing, apparently, that this was last year, and I'm assuming it's gonna be the same proposal, to raise the sales tax by a full 1%. Now that's more than two and a half times what the voters approved with the constitutional amendment. And I don't think, uh, I think we should really be truer to the, to the will of the voters there. Um, and again, it is a regressive tax. Uh, it puts more of the tax burden as a percentage of income on lower income people rather than on people who are more well to do. Um, the, uh, the real kicker in here, and at least as far as last year's proposal was concerned, was an offsetting cut in income taxes that would make the overall proposal revenue neutral. Now, the income tax is about the only progressive tax that we have. So increasing the sales tax, which is regressive, and cutting the only progressive tax means that we are dramatically shifting the tax burden onto lower income folks. And, and that, that is just, that is not acceptable to me. Um, but here's the real kicker. They're talking about that being revenue neutral. So you want to increase spending. You want to increase spending on outdoor recreation and environment. You want to increase spending on mental health, but you have revenue neutral as far as the taxes are concerned. Who's going to pay for the increased spending? My bottom line is it's got to come out of the education budget. And I will not support anything that leads to a cut in education. So, so there are pieces of the Invest in Iowa program that I could support. Uh, certainly funding for mental health needs to be found somewhere. Uh, the, the I will, the constitutional amendment, but making the tax system more regressive and leading to cuts in education is, is not in the overall interest of social justice. It's also not in the economic interest of this community. And, and remember as well, as far as chamber members are concerned, when you raise the sales tax, you're raising the, the, the bottom line price of the services that are sold at retail. Our restaurants are already hurting. They add additional costs on top of them, on top of anything. You know, I'm looking out the window here on Main Street, all of the retail businesses here. Um, that is not going to help our retail sector um, come back from all of the damage that they have suffered because of the pandemic. Thank you, Senator. You know, you touched on it a little bit there, but you, I often say we are a company town and that company is Iowa State University. And as the university goes, so goes Ames. And at the same time, Des Moines Area Community College is also a critical partner in this community. Uh, they're, they're a great economic development partner. And, you, 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 and you've already mentioned K-12, but as you think about uh, our region institutions and the community college system, and even the K-12 system, how do you think they will fare uh, in this in the 21 legislative session as it relates to their funding? Well, the community colleges have actually done fairly well. They have come through the last few years reasonably unscathed. K-12, our per pupil funding, uh, it's called supplemental state aid. That's a misnomer. It's not supplemental. It's the main part of, of education funding. That's fallen more than 2% behind inflation. We haven't even kept up with inflation over the last three years. So we need, to, we need to address that, plus the artificial drop in enrollment because of the pandemic and people keeping their kids at home. I expect those kids are gonna be back in school next year. We don't want an education funding drop uh, just because we had low enrollment artificially last fall. Uh, the university, um, I believe that they're freezing tuition again for this spring, but at some point they have to make up for the lost revenue and the, and the increased expenditures. Uh, if the state doesn't come up with the help, then they're going to have to ask the students for it, either that or they're going to have to uh, make compromises on the quality of education. You know, what, one of the key fundings, um, funding needs is the veterinary diagnostic lab out at the veterinary college. And you and I were, were there for the groundbreaking. Uh, it was a wonderful event, put I think $63 million into the first part of that this year. Uh, we need the other half of that funding. So I'm going to be working very hard on that. The, the vet college, I mean, 
if you ever weren't convinced of the value, and I don't know how anybody couldn't have been convinced of the value already, because it's absolutely critical to the health of, health of our animal agriculture. Uh, but this spring and summer, the vet lab, the vet diagnostic lab, shifted gears, pitched in, helping with the state hygienic lab to process all of the human coronavirus tests. Uh, and that was that was a marvelous, I mean, it shows the, 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 the expanded value that those lab research facilities and the, and the staff over there have for the, not just the animal health, for, but, for, but for those, those animals who call us ourselves human. Well said, and, you know, and, and selfishly, uh, Senator, uh, the, the, uh, the vet college is an economic driver for traditional economic development efforts, as you well know. When you see Merck and Beringer Ingelheim and all these animal health companies located in and around the Ames area, uh, one of the key drivers of that is the, is the vet, vet college. And so we're very pleased with the investment the state is making in that institution. Well, you're absolutely right there. Uh, you know, and and it's it's broader. I mean, the vet college is 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 a key uh, player there, but it's the overall facilities and resources that the university provides, uh, not just access to our scientific labs and our scientific discoveries and being able to commercialize them, but also the access to the personnel. The graduates from Iowa State that they can then hire. I mean, they're they're just down the road. They are they are absolutely first in line to hire our best and brightest, and to keep some of those great minds right here in in Iowa, in Ames, in Central Iowa. Um, you know, that's that's a case not just for investing in the vet college. That's a case for investing in the whole university. Well, you make a good point there. You know, the infrastructure of Iowa State University is immense. And it is a driver for a lot of things, a lot of good things, mostly good things that occur in the Ames and, and, and Central Iowa area. Here's the one that's- uh, Well, then, then we had a pretty successful football team this year, although not many fans were there to appreciate it in person, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, and you know what, they, they've had a terrific season and it's really been exciting. And you know, I've often said, I've been in Ames now about 14 years. It seems like when our athletic programs are doing well, uh, everybody's attitude is a little better in the Ames community too. So it's been a lot of fun to, to watch the football, season, football team this year. Hey, uh, here, here's, a, here's kind of a soft toss for you right here, Senator. Uh, Ames and Story County Day at the Capitol is being held on April 1st. No fooling. And uh, we'd love to do it in person. Do you think we'll get that opportunity in the 2021 legislative session? I would love to have you do it in person. It's always a tremendously popular event, not just because people get to meet all the folks from the chamber in the city, but I mean, Hickory Park, are you kidding? You know, and I know the people line up all the way down the hall and around the corner uh, to, to, to uh, partake of that wonderful uh, restaurant's goods. Um, I, I would love to say that we could do it. I'm not optimistic. Uh, you know, thank goodness we have a couple of vaccines that have now been improved. They're starting to be distributed, but broad scale uh, distribution of the vaccine uh, probably won't uh, uh, be fully in place until late second quarter, early third quarter this year. April 1st is just the start of the second quarter. I don't know that I would want to expose folks from Ames um, or the legislators or anybody else in the Capitol uh, to unnecessary risks. Um, maybe if you could, if we could, well, like so many other things, if you could do pick up at the corner, uh, we could do that. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy to work on ideas for you, but we have to put safety first. Without question, without question. Along those lines, do you envision uh, the legislative session kicking off differently than it normally has because of COVID? Well, I have argued with some people, I have urged some people to delay the start of the session. Um, apparently uh, that idea is not going to be adopted. Um, you know, really the first, the first month of the legislature, the only thing that we really have to get done is school funding for next year. Otherwise, Pretty much everything else could could wait a month until we 
we passed that. I expect, I'm sorry, we've, we've got a spike in cases because of Thanksgiving. I, I'm just, I'm scared that we're going to have another spike because of Christmas and, and New Year's and people getting together against, you know, medical advice. Um, you know, the first months of the legislature, whenever we do start, is mostly taken up with having subcommittee meetings where, where bills go in front of a subcommittee and that is when the public has a chance to come in and have their say and, and, and offer their uh, views and input. Uh, that's just going to be um, a tremendous risk uh, for virus transmission. If we close down the subcommittees, then we wouldn't get that input, which is often very crucial in, in perfecting legislation. So um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I know that there's going to be some provision for doing things by Zoom as we're doing here. I don't know that it's going to provide adequate in, uh, opportunity for public input. So, um, you know, obviously we're going to make have to make some changes. I would have preferred to wait a month to, to get started, except for absolutely necessary things like school funding. But um, look, uh, one of the other questions I'm going to jump your list a little bit. You you put down there how should people get hold of me? I do have a legislative email address. But frankly, that, that tends to get carpet bombed by every vendor who wants to sell something to the state and every, every person from whichever less educated state you want to name who can't tell the difference between the state Senate and the US Senate. The best way to get a hold of me, two, two ways to do it. Uh, my home email is H-C-Q-B-A-C-H. That's C as in Charles. HCQBach at gmail.com. I look at my own personal email two or three times a day. The other way to get a hold of me, I'm home every evening, sometimes not very early, but I'm home every evening, every weekend. Uh, my home number is in the book. It's 2928984. And Leah's going to kill me for giving that out in the public, but then she voted for me, so what the heck. Very good. Well, that's, that's good to know. You know, it, it seems like everybody has their own method of, of being contacted. Some, some of your folks like text messages and others appreciate email and other forms of correspondence. So it's good to know. Well, you know, uh, they invented this marvelous technology with instantaneous two-way communication where you can not only get the words, but you can pick up the tone of voice and you don't have to type and you don't have to spell. It's called the telephone. <laughs> it's my favorite. If we can't do face-to-face, -face, that's my favorite. Duly noted, if you want to talk to Senator Kornbach, you pick up the phone and give him a call. Herman, uh, as, as we wrap up our time, do you have any other final thoughts or comments you'd like to make uh, to the members of the Chamber of Commerce as you contemplate and get ready for the 2021 session? Well, I guess, um, I guess the one thought that, I, that I'd leave you with, and, and this is something the Chamber has done a very good job at, is to continue to encourage people to use their masks. Okay, I got mine, got mine right here. Use your mask, social distance. Uh, I know it, it's painful to not get together with relatives at Christmas time, but if you can stick it out for another couple of months, Till this vaccine gets into, these vaccines get into wide distribution. Um, you know, one forecast I saw uh, that are absent, absent good faith efforts along those lines, we could have as many as a half a million Americans dead. We're already over 300,000. Uh, so look, people, keep it up, use your mask, social distance, wash hands, use sanitizer, all that kind of good stuff. Stay safe so that next year, by, by the time we get around to next fall, we can all get together at football games and, and social parties, and, and Thanksgiving a year from now should be quite a celebration. That sounds good, Senator. Again, I want to thank you for your time this afternoon. Senator Herman Kornbach, uh, thanks for the, your work in Des Moines on behalf of the citizens and the businesses and organizations here in the Ames and Story County area. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's a wrap. Okay, thank you for the time.